we can we can go. Uh, I am really excited for today's lesson. Um, I Nephi's vision is fascinating, and I wanted to take this class today down the same avenue that Jeff did last week and talk about the temple uh, to begin with. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to do a quick recap um, of last week. Last week we talked about Lehi's dream. Um, uh, in Lehi's dream, we have a man in a white robe. Um, we identified that that could be uh, symbolic of the priests uh, of the temple in the Temple of Solomon. We talked about the spacious world that Lehi was um, uh, followed into, which could be the court of the temple. Uh, we talked about Nephi and um, uh, Sam and uh, his mother Sariah, that they were found at the head of the waters, which could be Jerusalem. We talked about the iron rod potentially being near Jerusalem with the brass plates. Um, the great and spacious building potentially could be the, the temple of, of Solomon. Uh, the mist of darkness, potentially an altar of incense. Um, the tree of life, uh, meaning the lamp or the, the tree of the woman uh, in the temple. And then the fruit of the tree potentially being manna or bread. Um, and these are all just uh, thoughts. Um, I, you know, this isn't this isn't uh, the true word of prophecy. But these are just things that Neph Lehi's dream has a lot of things that relate to the temple that he was familiar with, which is the Temple of Solomon. Um, I wanted to continue uh, talking about that, and I wanted to bring up a couple other thoughts because I wanted to build this conversation today about um, or begin the conversation about the ascent, about bringing ourselves to the throne of God, because that's that's ultimately the um, the pattern of all temples. Um, you have Solomon's temple. I, I made some nice uh, uh, colored blocks um, that could represent a few different things. Um, I'm going to refer to this throughout today, but uh, I, in red, we have the Molten Sea. Um, in orange, we have the, uh, uh, the inside of the temple where the, the, temp the shoe, shoe bread is and the menorahs are and um, the altar of incense. We have a veil and then we have the Holy of Holies. Um, it's funny, I found these pictures actually on a website talking about how the Solomon's Temple is so different than the temp the LDS Temple, and you can't really compare the two. Um, uh, the, the goal that I wanted to have today is not necessarily comparing the function of the temples, but uh, talking about um, the goal of the temple uh, whether it's Solomon's Temple or the outcome of the Kirtland Temple or the, te the LDS Temple was to be in the presence of God and to receive the blessing that he is supposed to or that he is meant to give us um, at the throne of God. So I, I, I'm going to begin this by uh, I, uh, talking a little bit about the Kirtland Temple because this is interesting with the Kirtland Temple. Um, it's not really a temple that uh, we're all familiar with, um, but uh, in in that uh, it doesn't have it didn't have ordinances. Um, it was uh, the first temple of uh, uh, that Joseph built, so the one that was actually dedicated and Christ visited. But in the answer to the covenant, we have. On the third day of April, 1836, Joseph and Oliver were in the temple in Kirtland, Ohio. The veil was taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. They saw the Lord in his glory standing above them, and the breastwork of the pulpit, and under his feet appeared as if it were paved work of pure gold, in the color like amber. His eyes were a flame of fire, his hair of his head was white like pure snow, his countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sounding of rushing great waters. 
even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am, I am Alpha and Omega. I am he who was slain. I am he who lives. I am your advocate with the Father. As this vision closed, the heavens were opened again to their view, and they saw and beheld and were endowed with knowledge from the beginning of creation to the ends thereof. And they were shown unspeakable things from the sealed record of heaven, which man is not capable of making known, but must be revealed by the powers of heaven. They beheld Michael the archangel, Gabriel and Raphael, and diverse angels from Michael or Adam down to the end of time, showing in their turns, their dispensations, their rights, their keys, their honors, their majesties, and powers of their priesthood, giving line upon line, precept upon precept, endowing them with knowledge, even here a little and there a little. I'm going to stop there. So the end outcome of the Kirtland Temple, the one temple that was dedicated, it received a sign from heaven um, of being received by Christ visiting it, the only one that uh, um, has received that. Um, and, uh, you know, they had a day of Pentecost, which is a sign from, from the Father of acceptance. Um, um, so this is the outcome of this temple. Now, what does this have to do with Nephi's dream, or excuse me, Nephi's vision? When we look at, when we look at uh, um, Lehi, we are seeing, oh God, he, he has this experience where he, is wanting to pray for his, his uh, he's, he's pondering over his people. He wants to pray in behalf of them. And he prays and boom, immediately he gets this theophany um, that he sees this uh, fire on a rock, which there's lots of meaning on both the fire and the rock. Um, and then he goes back home and he has this vision where he's brought into the temple of God. Um, he uh, experiences a... Um, uh, Denver actually talks about in his uh, blog uh, potentially a um, an ordinance or a, a ritual that's happening that the angels are praising their God uh, in their temple. Nephi, on the other hand, his journey is a little bit different. He's not having, and we, we don't know the background of Lehi um, uh, beyond what uh, we experience in chapter 1. Of first Nephi, but Nephi's path is a little bit different. But Nephi's path has a lot in it that um, we can think about uh, things in the LDS temple. We can think about things um, in other places. And um, uh, but let's let's begin with this. Nephi's path begins with. Uh, he received a witness from heaven, uh, wherefore I cried unto the Lord, and beheld he did visit me and did soften my heart, that I did believe all the words which had been spoken by my father. He then has, he received a promise from heaven, blessed art thou Nephi because of thy faith, for thou hast sought me diligently with lowliness of heart, and inasmuch as ye keep my commandments, ye, prosper, uh, ye shall prosper and shall be led to the land of promise. So he first he receives a witness from heaven, a guide, a guide, a, 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 an impression, a a a, um, a a a visit from heaven. A, a thinking about Moses, um, what it talks about the record of heaven, the peaceable things of immortal glory, the truth of all things. He receives this witness. And then he's he continues to be obedient. Um, he becomes becomes true and faithful to the things that he receives, and as a result, he receives additional knowledge, truth, and goodness. Um, he uh, he has tests. Nephi has tests. He he's tested whether he's willing to consecrate all that he has. One of the things that um, he consecrates is all of his inheritance. Um, not only leaving Jerusalem, but willing to go back and, and um, sell all of uh, all the money, gold, precious things that his father had, which which ultimately would go back to him. Um, he, in addition to that, he sees an angel. The angel casts out the the um, the evil that's in his brothers. Um, uh, casts out, uh, you could say, casts out the adversary, or in in the context that his brothers are trying to destroy him, um, they're a devil to him. Uh, he breaks every bound. He uh, um, uh, when they go back and get the Ishmael and his family. 
Um, Laman and Lemuel and the uh, sons of Ishmael tie um, Nephi up. Um, there's a, a, a talk about the strength of the Lord being the power of the atonement or the power of the Son of God. He has given that power and that witness. These things uh, allow him to grow and ascend um, line upon line, grace from grace. Um, and uh, those things bring him to where he's at at this point. There's a lot of ascension text, ascension um, theology around what is ex what's ex happening with Nephi at this time. Uh, I wanted to quote uh, Moroni at this time, uh, Moroni, um, and because he had done this, my brethren uh, hath. Uh, and because he hath done this, my brethren, my beloved brethren, hath miracles ceased. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, neither have angels ceased to minister unto the children of men. For behold, they are subject unto him to minister according to the word of his command, showing themselves unto them of strong faith and a firm mind in every form of godliness. This ascent, this uh, transformation that uh, Nephi is experiencing and that he's getting proven um, is, is part of uh, receiving every form of godliness. Now, at this point in chapter 3, where we begin, we don't begin at the beginning of um, uh, the head of the water at this time. We've moved past this. If we're thinking in context of the temple, Nephi is at this point at the veil. He is, he is before the veil, and he has the ability to, uh, he's, he's seeking, he's wanting to know additional light and truth. So if we think about Nephi's journey as the journey through uh, Solomon's temple, or the journey through an LDS temple, or even the journey through the Kirtland temple, like Oliver and Joseph in Kirtland, um, Nephi is is wanting to receive the blessing that he expects God would give him. Now, this is not um, this is not uh, foreign to the Book of Mormon. There's quite a bit of crying unto the Lord and receiving a blessing. We have this from Lehi, um, where he. Uh, at the beginning of the book, cried with his, uh, prayed unto the Lord um, with all his heart in behalf of his people. Um, Enos, he cried mightily to God in prayer and supplication. King Laban, um, or, or, Laman, King Laman, that should be King Laman. That's a, that's a typo. King Laman cried mightily to the God um, with Aaron, "Wilt thou make thyself known unto me?" Um, the brother of Jared, we know his story, cried unto the Lord, um, uh, seeking the Lord's blessing. Now, they're, they have the confidence to do that because they've been able to acquire the faith to do so. So when we enter Nephi, at 1 Nephi uh, chapter 3, we're entering the the the. Um, you could say the end of his journey in the, the temple where he's at the veil. And he says, I knew if I was desirous also that I might see and hear and know uh, these things by the power of the Holy Ghost, which is the gift of uh, God unto all those who diligently seek him, as well as in times of old, as in time that he should manifest himself unto the children of men. For he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the way is prepared for all men from the foundation of the world if it so be that they repent and come unto him, for he that diligently seeketh shall find, and the mysteries of God shall be unfolded to them by the power of the Holy Ghost. Um, so Nephi is at this point. Uh, he wants to see, he wants to hear, he wants to know. Um, I, he believes that he will receive the mysteries of God, um, and uh, he's brought to this point. Now, what's amazing is Nephi is then given a test at the veil, and his test is, does he believe the things that his father has uh, told him? It's a very basic test, um, and uh, it, it goes on in the top corner. It says, and the spirit said unto me, behold, what desirest thou? And I said, I desire to behold the things which my father saw. 
there is so much um, parallel um, language just in that first sentence from what is experienced in modern day temples um, that Nephi is experiencing at this point for him. And the Spirit said unto me, Be, Believest thou that thy father saw the tree which he has spoken? And I, and I said, Yea, and thou knowest that I believe all the words of my father. And when I had spoken these words, the Spirit cried with a loud voice, saying, Hosanna to the Lord, the Most High God. This reminds me or makes me think of what... Uh, um, uh, what Lehi experienced. He experiences a, a Hosanna. He experiences the, the concourses of angels singing and praising their God. Um, but Nephi has this, this, uh, uh, this test that he's given. Um, do you believe your father? Um, he answers yes. And the spirit cries with a loud voice and, um, allows him to experience the next things that he's experiencing in his vision. So jumping into the, the vision itself, it's, if you continue the thought process around the temple, it is interesting to me, uh, whether it's, uh, I, I don't believe it's coincidence, but it's interesting to me that the first thing that he sees is he sees the the mother and the the covenant son um, in Nephi's vision? We start with wisdom and the anointed one, um, as we talked about in the the uh, previous lessons. The Deuteronomist took away the tree um, wisdom, um, but Nephi goes on and he talks about um, the mother of the son of God. And the things that he talks about, about the woman, about the virgin, his descriptions, his adjectives are very similar to the adjectives that he's using for the tree of life and the fruit. He talks about the beauty and the whiteness thereof did exceed the whiteness of the driven snow. Um, she was fair and white, most beautiful and fair above all virgins. Um uh, it, it, I, I don't believe that there's a coincidence there. And it's interesting um, in um, there is a, in Clementine's recognition. This is a, uh, talked about with uh, Margaret Barker. She talks about that, although indeed he was the son of God and the beginning of all things, he became man. God first anointed him with oil taken from the wood of the tree of life from the anointing. He became uh, Christ. So in this, it talks about how the, um, it was the, it was the wood of the tree of life that anointed the Christ, or you could say it was the woman that anointed the Christ that became the Christ. Now, is this, is this, uh, um, is this, uh, I, I, uh, against scripture? Um, I don't think so. This falls right in line with, with the scripture. I'm going to read from Matthew, and I'm going to read from the testimony of John. And when and both of them, one's talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus. The other is talking ma about Mary Magdalene. Uh, and it says, when, And when they had come into the temple, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they opened their treasures, they presented him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Uh, the wise men uh, gave the gifts to the mother. She, they gave the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh to the mother. Uh, going on to the testimony of John, it says, And among those who were present were his mother and Mary, and the elect lady, who was the companion of Jesus. So now we have both Marys that are present at the anointing of Christ. And she cut off seven locks of his hair, that had been cut before because of the because of the vow which had not been cut before because of the of the vow which fell at her feet this troubled his disciples who feared his strength would depart from him but said nothing because Jesus permitted it to be done Jesus seeing their concern asked is not a lamb shorn before it is sacrificed 
but they did not understand his meaning. And she took royal oil used to coronate a king containing uh, spikenard, frankincense, and myrrh, and applied it to the head, arm, and leg, hands, legs, and feet of Jesus. My mother uh, was safeguard, uh, has, oh, this is Christ talking, um, it goes on in the, the chapter. My mother has safeguarded this gift from my birth until now to be used for this moment. This anointing is required be, to be done to establish me before I lay down my life. The poor are always in need in this world, but I reign among you for only a short while, and then I'm offered up as a sacrifice on your behalf. Um, isn't it, it, this is so fascinating to me as I, I, as I started thinking about the temple. So we have the temple of Solomon, you have, um, instead of ordinances, Nephi is, uh, actively participating in his true endowment, um, by being tested and tried in his mortal experiences. This brings him up to be refined, um, uh, to uh, receive every form of godliness. He's at the veil. He's praying to the father at the veil to part the veil like the brother of Jared. He opens, the veil opens, he receives a test. And then uh, in Solomon's temple, uh, once you part the veil, you have the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubims. Um, the Ark of the Covenant representing the covenant and the law, the law is inside the Ark of the Covenant with the, the um, uh, ten um, uh, co ten commandments and the law of the law that uh, he set with uh, uh, the Israelites. Um, and then you have the covenant; it's in the Ark of the Covenant. You have now Nephi, who, if he's in the temple, you know, theoretically through this process. He immediately, his first thing that he sees when he parts the veil is he sees the mother and the son. Um, the mother anoints the son, um, or the, the woman anoints the son. Um, now, what happens next is interesting, too, because... And this is this is a picture of uh, I enlarged the picture of what um, the Temple of Solomon potentially looked like. So if you think about again Nephi, what he's experiencing in his vision, um, I you can have um, you see that he's the anointed Christ. The first thing that he sees is the mother, which is the tree, the white above all that is white. Then he sees the one preparing the way. Go ye the Lord, or go ye out. Um, and uh, he sees John the Baptist, the baptizer. Is there a symbolism there of we just anointed a king, um, the, the mother, the, the virgin anointed the king, and this is what Nephi seeing. And now we have the forerunner preparing the way for the king to enter his uh, kingdom. And then we have 12 apostles. Now, I want to go uh, um, pull away from the LDS thinking that these 12 apostles were, um, you know, leading his church and that this was a quorum of men that had administrative rights and privileges over the uh, churches in um, the Middle East and uh, uh, Asia and Europe. Um, I, I, I would much rather take that to think of what an apostle actually is, uh, which is a, a witness of Christ, uh, whether it's Peter or whether it's Paul. Um, but even more, what's, what's an interesting thought is potentially on the sides of all the walls, not only um, at the Ark of the Covenant, but on the sides of all the walls are cherubims. Um, when Denver has talked about this, when Christ comes, he comes with an entourage. Uh, he comes with his hosts of heaven. Um, and we can see that um, um, he's talking about um, something more elevated than just a, a, an office in, in, a, in a church. He's talking about um, 
his his anointed apostles, his, his uh, those that uh, um, are following the Christ. So, I, I I'd like to pause. Do we have any Do we have any uh, uh, thoughts so far? Do, do you want me to pause for a second? Oh, I went backwards. All right. So I'm, I'm going to continue on because Nephi then breaks apart. This this jumps ahead in uh, uh, First Nephi three uh, page or uh, paragraph twenty eight. Is he talks in his vision? He's talking about two things, two unique things. I Nephi beheld the power of the Lamb of God that it descended upon the saints of the Church of the Lamb. And upon the covenant people of the Lord. Um, uh, this isn't necessarily talking about one group of people. It actually potentially and probably is talking about two unique groups of people. Because as you talk, think about the saints of the Church of the Lamb, again, this is not some organized organization, uh, a celestial organization done by man. The saints of the Church of the Lamb that Nephi is now seeing in his vision, um, uh, talking about the the apostles of the Lamb or those that uh, um, had the seal of the Lamb on their foreheads. Um, these are baptized, washed, and cleansed from all their sins, overcome by faith, sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. These are, this is the Church of the Firstborn. Um so Nephi is seeing this. He's seeing the church of the, the Lamb. And uh, just some uh, more about it. This is coming from Revelations, uh, Revelation. Um, the, talking about the saints of the Lamb or the church of the firstborn. It's those who overcome um, and eat of the tree of life. Um, again, there's temple uh, symbolism there. Um, those that are faithful that the second death won't have problems with, um, him that overcome and eat the manna. Again, there's temple symbolism here. They're eating the manna with the Christ. Um, they're given a, a stone. We think, uh, um, in Mosiah, uh, what, uh, you know, stone or, uh, uh, they, they have the ability to have seership, um, uh, they are overcome by uh, because they follow the works of God. Um, uh, they make a pillar in the temple with with their God. Um, uh, God writes His name um, on their forehead, um, and um, they are granted to be able to sit with uh, the Christ on His uh, next to Him as on on His throne. Um, uh, again, these are just fascinating uh, things in the context of, let's think of the temple. Let's think of what Nephi is seeing. Um, uh, as Nephi goes on, again, let's think about uh, um, uh, the Church of the Lamb and the Covenant people being two separate things in this, in Nephi's vision. The first thing that Nephi sees is um, uh, the... Church of the Lamb, the saints, the apostles of the Lamb, uh, getting uh, the world is fighting against them. But but what's interesting about this is it, it's not the world as in Babylon. If you read thir First Nephi three fourteen, it says, "Behold the world," and then we need to understand what is the world in this context, and the wisdom there of yea the house of Israel. So. Um, Nephi is seeing that those who are sealed by the Christ, those who are the saints, the Lamb, or the Church of the Lamb, they're get, they're the, the the ones who are fighting them is the is Israel. Israel is fighting them. Um, have gathered together to fight against the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And again, I, I don't like use thinking about the LDS term of twelve apostles being an administrative body because there was no administrative body in Europe or Asia during uh, the first century. Twelve represents priesthood. Um, apostles represents witnesses of Christ, firsthand witnesses of Christ. So you have the priesthood from heaven, these anointed um, uh, sealed upon their heads uh, priests that are going out 
and the uh, Israel is fighting against them. And Israel is fighting against them because um, they bear record, um, or they they uh, because of their pride. Um, uh, they're fighting against the the ones Christ chose. So I wanted to take this uh, um, thought about Israel fighting against Zion. Um, um, not only is there a progression of uh, individuals like Nephi uh, received, but there's also a progression of societies and peoples. Babylon goes to Jerusalem, Jerusalem goes to Zion. But as we see in Nephi's vision, Babylon will always fight Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will always fight Zion. Um, they, 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 uh, it, it's it's just a it's a condition. Um, the conditions of of Jerusalem is is if we think about what Jeff talked about last week with potentially the great and spacious building being the temple in Jerusalem um, and the the ironic um, pointing of fingers and mocking um, that comes because of blindness, hardness of heart. Um, choosing broad roads. You think of uh, the end of Second Nephi, where Nephi talks about lie a little, take advantage of one because of his his words. Um, it's because of uh, all is well in Zion, Zion prospereth. Um, these are the conditions of Jerusalem, and as the um, uh, apostles of the Lamb are um, going out and preaching, it's Jerusalem that's fighting against them. It's the house of Israel. Um, I, then what, what happens is the green space or the, the, the whore of all the earth that Nephi talks about, um, I, whose founder is, is of the devil. You, you actually have that language again in revelation, um, that the, av the, the adversary, um, actively when there are anointed priests, the, the adversary takes a much more prominent role in his active, direct fight against the apostles of the Lamb. This happens in Revelation, I believe it's Revelation 4. Um, it happens here with um, uh, Nephi, what he's seeing in his vision. Um, and what happens is Babylon and Jerusalem start fighting against uh, Christ's um, people. Um, what Nephi is, is, uh, I, I want to take a step back because I was thinking about this last night. Um, I, when you have, a um, Nephi and imagine him, uh, talking to the Lord, um, the Ark of the Covenant, this, this funny, uh, this funny uh, uh, graphic right here with somebody talking to God on the Ark of the Covenant. What I am thinking that this could mean in Nephi's vision is that when Nephi is receiving what he's receiving, he is receiving God's covenants. He's, he's looking at what God is covenanting to do with not only Nephi, but Nephi's people and uh, um, Nephi, uh, the people of the world. It's, it's the covenants of God that we're seeing. So as we see um, Israel uh, fighting against Zion, and we see the, the great and abominable church, uh, the whore of all the earth forming, um, that uh, is taking away the plain and precious parts of the gospel. What uh, Nephi is experiencing with uh, his vision is he's experiencing the Lord communicating to Nephi the overall covenants that he has, not only with Nephi, but with the Lord. Um, I, now, what happens next is we have... Uh, I, the experience Nephi seeing Babylon go to Jerusalem. Now we see that uh, uh, the Gentiles will receive much of the gospel. 
So after after the horror of all the earth uh, overcomes the twelve, uh, the the uh, uh, anointed uh, priests of of Christ going out into the world, um, sometime in the future for Nephi, we are seeing that the Gentiles will bring much of the gospel. Now it says, "I will be merciful unto the Gentiles in that day, insomuch that I will bring forth unto them in mine own power." much of my gospel, which shall be plain and precious. Um, one of the notes here is that this too is a progression. Um, Babylon doesn't go to Zion. Um, that typically is not the path. Um, Babylon typically goes to Jerusalem, and then Jerusalem goes to Zion. So when Nephi is, is hearing from the angel of the Lord that uh, much of the gospel is going to be uh, come from the Gentiles, it does not say all of the gospel. It says much of it. Um, and uh, um, and there, there's, there's, a, there's things behind that. These last records, which... Thou hast seen among the Gentiles shall establish the truth of the first, which are of the twelve apostles of the land, Lamb, and shall make known the plain and precious things which have been taken away from them, and shall make known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father, the Savior of the world, and that all men must come unto him, or they cannot be saved." Um, so much of, much of God's gospel is going to get restored through the Gentiles. It's going to overcome plain and precious things which have been taken away, primarily the covenants of the Lord. Um, but there's, there's other things that, uh, um, are getting restored as well. And I want to talk about them in just a second. Um, is there any comments or are there any comments? Okay. Okay. What happens next is interesting. Is Nephi is seeing that Babylon? We're we're going to go from Babylon to Jerusalem. The gospel is going to go to the Gentiles, and then there is uh, there are some conditions. Um, if you look at this chapter, the Gentiles aren't guaranteed success to go from Jerusalem to to Zion. It says, and it shall come to pass that if, if I wanted to capitalize and build that, if the Gentile shall hearken unto the Lamb of God in that day, he shall manifest himself uh, unto them, manifest himself unto them in word, and also in power, and in very deed. So the Gentiles are given the opportunity to have God manifest himself in word in power, and in very deed. Um, I, I think through that, and I think through um, what it, what is Zion? What does it take to be Zion? Zion is a, a place where God will walk and talk with his people, um, where he will be present, where um, all poor, uh, there will be no poor among them. Well, there, there will be one heart and one mind, the, the Gentiles are given an opportunity that they will be able to have Zion if um, they f hearken unto the Lamb of God. Um, and then God will manifest himself in word, in power, and in very deed. And then they shall be numbered among the seed of uh, uh, thy father. Now that, there's an interesting uh, uh, blog post done by Denver and he actually talks about that. Who is um, Joseph's father? Who would be Joseph's father in the patriarchal line? Um, it would actually be Lehi. Lehi would be Joseph Smith's father in the patriarchal line of priesthood, um, because we get uh, we would get adopted unto the seed of the father, the covenant seed, which. The, the Gentiles are not the covenant seed. The, the covenant seed is, is Lehi's seed. 
Um, and that's why uh, in this in this uh, section it says that they shall be numbered among the seed of thy father. Um, continuing on, I, w was there any questions? Comments? Okay. Continuing on, there's a progression from the um, much of my gospel to a marvelous, great and marvelous work. Um, that doesn't happen at the same time of the much of my gospel. Um, the great and marvelous work isn't about going to England and Ireland and Western Europe and getting converts and bringing them back. Um, uh, the converts that happened at, in the 1800s, um, uh, those, those are Gentile converts. Uh, those are non-covenanted converts. Um, uh, that's not the part of the great and marvelous work. That's the much of my gospel. The great and marvelous work is still in the future. Um, and it is uh, um, uh, the work to bring about Zion, which Zion did not happen, uh, has not happened yet. It didn't happen in Kirtland or Nauvoo or Salt Lake City, um, uh, but it is still a future event. Um, then it goes on, it says, uh, uh, when is this going to happen? Uh, the day of the Lord will fulfill his covenants is then at that day when the Lord shall commence in preparing the way to fulfill his covenants, which he had made to his people who are the house of Israel. This is the time where um, uh, the Lord is going to unleash judgments to the world. He begins his marvelous work. Um, oh, sorry. I think that was, no, no, no. Was that last? That was the last one. So um, I, just to wrap up, as I was thinking through what Nephi was experiencing, um, I think of him at the veil. I think of him entering the presence of the Lord. Um, the first things that he sees where the Ark of the Covenant in the temple, where the physical representation of what the real thing should be, um, the Ark of the Covenant and the cherubims, um, he sees the mother anointing the son, or, or he sees the woman, uh, this is actually Mary, Mary, we see the woman anointing the son to become the, the, the uh, sacrificial lamb. We see um, the, the forerunner preparing the way for the king. Um, we see the anointed priest coming down, preaching to the world. We see Jerusalem uh, fighting against Zion. Or fighting against the anointed, high, the true anointed high priests, we see the adversary, the devil, actively fighting against. He comes out from his abyss, and he fights, and he overpowers the the saints of the Lamb, um, and forms the whore of all the earth, which is um, uh, Babylon. Babylon, um, not Babylon as the world, but Babylon as a knockoff. Um, and knock off Zion. Um, and then we have the covenants of the Lord to bring Babylon back to Zion and then fulfill the covenants, which uh, uh, Nephi experiences. It's all just a very fascinating and, and wonderful vision that Nephi has. Um, I'd love to stop and see if there's any uh, thoughts or, or questions about uh, uh, what we talked about. Okay, I'm going to read something from Doug. He says, um, it's interesting that the Restoration Book of Mormon st states not that Nephi sees the formation of a great and abominable church as in the LED edition. He sees the formation of it. The latter suggests that Nephi is not witnessing the chronological beginnings of a new movement fostering abominations, but perhaps pre-existing foundations as in a foundation of a large building, which could have several complexes. This idea implies that the great and abominable church could have always existed. If that church is everyone who belongs to the kingdom of the devil, the idea that Nephi... 
uh, is, is seeing extensions of it makes more sense to me. Oh, I'm going to, I apologize. I'm going to unmute everybody. Everybody should be unmuted. So uh, you would just need to unmute yourself to comment. Uh, David K. talked about how um, it's interesting that uh, Lehi's dream is allegorical and Nephi's vision is prophetic. I, I completely agree. Uh, Doug also talked about or commented, in general, Nephi is first shown Christ as the preeminent event and principles. Then he has shown events throughout history. Speaking broadly, perhaps I should be reading uh, uh, chapter or four chapters of Nephi's vision with the idea how human events supports God's love. Well, in Nephi's chapter one, when Lehi was shown the destruction of Jerusalem and his reaction was to praise God's mercy and love. Maybe I don't see that enough. Sorry. I know we're going to get to those issues as we go along. Uh, another one, the Zangs. I like the progression from Babylon to Jerusalem to Zion. Um uh, David said, I, I like the correlation between Babylon equals the whore equals counterfeit spiritual identity. And Jeff said that uh, Babylon could also refer to the Jews that returned to Jerusalem after being taken over by Babylon. The religion that they brought back was corrupt. One of the things, too, as I was thinking about this, is that uh, what is the what is the difference between Jerusalem and Babylon? One of them is Babylon has no covenants. Uh, Jerusalem at least has Aaronic covenants. Uh, if you look at what was the plain and precious things that were taken away um, from the book, it was covenants. Um, the 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 covenants to the saints of uh, uh, saints of the Lord, uh, they they didn't have covenants, um, or we didn't know about the covenants. Um, so you know what happens when you have religion um, becoming Babylon? Now there there is a um, I Jerusalem has become Babylon before. But what the Lord did in the past is he uh, trimmed the tree. He had the Assyrians take over. Uh, he had the Babylonians take over. And he pruned the tree to bring back the, the – uh, to strengthen the tree. What happens when uh, Babylon becomes – or Jerusalem becomes Babylon – and there isn't that. This is what we experience with the, the great and abominable church. Um, the Zang said, could the destruction of the Jerusalem have been relief if they were really oppressed? Hence the rejoicing. Uh, David uh, says, Skousen talks about how Israel may have signed up for this route out of time, willing to be scattered to, to spread the gospel throughout the world, accomplishing God's will. Definitely a possibility. All right, well, um, if there's anything else, I... Um, any other thoughts about this? Hey, hey Bryce, this is David. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Hey, I just want to say thanks for presenting this. I, this has been really interesting. I think um, it kind of draws out some of the ascension theology. The reason I say that is because my traditional way of thinking of this is just sort of chronologi chronologically. Um, and, and I think this sort of adds another flavor to it. That's that's really interesting. Yeah, it, 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 you know, there there's so much that you can look at with the, the scripture, so many ways that you can uh, approach them. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. No. So I've, I've, I've gotten a lot out of this. So thanks. All right. Anyone else? All right. Well, have a wonderful Sunday and uh, um, talk to you next week.